As we continue to look into these stories from the book of Acts, uh, it is confusing, confusing to keep up with who we are talking about because there are so many different apostles. So we began this series by talking about Peter, Peter, him and other apostles being bold in front of the uh, authorities. We remember that scene. And then the following Sunday, we talked about Paul, his experience on the road to Damascus, the conversion or the calling experience. And then the following week, we switched again to talk about Peter, his encounter with a disciple named Tabitha. And then last week, we stayed with Peter's journey, uh, this time about his dream about a large sheet coming down from heaven by its four corners with all bunch of animals, right? We remember that. And then today we're switching back to talk about Paul. So Peter, Paul, Peter, Peter, and then Paul, all right? Who are we talking about today? Oh, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> that was like two seconds ago I told you. Today Paul is meeting with a woman named Lydia. Paul is meeting with a woman named Lydia at an unexpected destination of the city in Macedonia, led by an unexpected vision of a man asking for help in Macedonia. And these weren't just a simple detour of a physical destination, but it must have been very unexpected to where Paul's heart was because he was coming out from intense moments of conflict just before this. So just before these things happened in chapter 16, in chapter 15, we see the first major division within Christianity. Did you hear that? First major division in Christian history. The church of Antioch, so you see Antioch on the right corner, right there. We're just going to follow the map today. So, uh, So Antioch was growing in numbers where the number of Gentiles, non-Jews, who were uh, choosing to become followers of Jesus Christ also increased in numbers. And there was a disagreement among the followers if uh, if they needed to be circumcised in order to be saved or not. So that was the big issue. Because in Genesis chapter 17, it says, you are to undergo circumcision and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. Sign of the covenant between me and you. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So that was the word in the book of Genesis. So, so I think it's important for us to remember that Christianity didn't begin as a religion, an independent religion, but it was a sect of a Judaism. So among them, there were those Pharisees who continued to argue the importance of following the teachings of Moses, the law of Moses. But for Paul, Paul, his understanding of salvation was not earn, earned by the obedience of law to the law, but he viewed it as a gift, salvation as a gift and grace made possible by Jesus' death and resurrection. That was Paul's idea. So a new covenant established by God through the cup, right? As we repeat until this day, whenever we share the great thanksgiving with one another. We say, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of new covenant. We say that, which is poured out for many for for the forgiveness of sins. So with the testimonials from Paul, Barnabas, and Peter was there too at the uh, the church of Antioch, Um, James, oh no, actually they went down to Jerusalem, which is at the bottom low. So, so the debate uh, was happening at the Jerusalem, which was the head church, um, the, the, the headquarters of the church, Christian church. So they went down, and James 
uh, was the head of the church, uh, the first church. And James makes the final judgment that the Gentiles shouldn't be required to be circumcised in order to be saved. So James makes that. So that was the first model of a church making decisions through a church council. All right, church council chair. All right, this is, this is the first model. Um, so this is all happening in chapter 15. Chapter 15. So uh, Paul was just coming out from being at the core of that heated and sensitive moment for the church. But that wasn't the end of his involvement in a conflict situation. Beginning with verse 36 of that ch- same chapter 15, he was in disagreement with his travel partner Barnabas about whether to take John, also known as Mark, John Mark, along with them on the journey. Barnabas wanted to take him with them. Paul disagreed because John Mark didn't help them during their first missionary journey. So they decided to separate. Barnabas and Paul, they decided to separate. Barnabas took uh, John Mark towards Cyprus, to the island, and um, and Paul took a guy named Silas through Syria and Cilicia. So, if I was in Paul's situation, my heart would be keep, uh, would keep beating like crazy after all these intentional, uh, intense relational situations and moments. They were just coming out from that. And this was where Paul's heart was when he began this second missionary journey. Not where things were going as planned, not where things were all figured out, but I assume that there is one very important piece that we can learn from Paul through this today's story with Lydia. And this is what enables Paul to enter into the uncharted territory of Macedonia. And that is the word open. Openness. Right? So, for your information, Macedonia is across that ocean to Greece. So this is the Turkey, modern-day Turkey, um, and then and from Troas to Neopolis, um, that's where he changed the route. So Paul's crew, Paul and Silas, and Timothy, who joined the journey along the way, and possibly Luke, the writer of the Gospel of Luke, Luke and Acts, is on this missionary journey. Their initial intention was to expand towards the north. They were uh, initially planning to go up north um, in, in the Asian continent. But the spirit of Jesus, uh, this is verse 7 of uh, chapter 16, the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they couldn't go up. They couldn't enter. So, they, so you see that arrow going up and then turning to Troas? So they were planning on going up towards that way, but they couldn't get in. So they turned their route to Troas. So when they were staying at a place called Troas, he sees a vision of a man begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And Macedonia is that whole area across that ocean. So they went. They went to a place where it was not on their plan. They went to a place that they've probably never been to before. They went to a place where there weren't that many Jews like them. It was a clear leap of faith. And it wasn't only that. Paul has a u- usual pattern. So usually, what, whenever he goes to a town, whenever he's on a journey, the first place he will visit at a town is a Jewish synagogue. So he starts from there. He goes to a synagogue, and he starts from there. But the town called Philippi in Macedonia, is, which is the next town uh, after Neopolis, did not have a synagogue. So the practice was that there needs to be at least 10 Jewish male in town to build 
a synagogue. So that was a practice. So probably they didn't have a big Jewish population there. So this place of prayer that we heard about in the scripture, the place of prayer at the riverside outside of the gate, was a place where Jews gathered to pray and worship God because they didn't have a synagogue. I will admit that a lot of my attention has been uh, throughout this past few days on the future of the United Methodist Church. I will um, admit that as new movements emerge by different groups around the country after the recent general conference in February. So for those of, those of you who are wondering what this is all about, or I've never heard of it, uh, of it this before, um, if I just uh, uh, lay out the facts. Uh, back in February, the highest ruling body of our denomination, the General Conference, had a special gathering to specifically discuss about the denominational stance regarding marriage and ordination of uh, homosexual individuals. The end result was in favor of the traditional plan, which was to stay with the current language in the church law, which reads, the United Methodist Church does not condone the practice of homosexuality and considers this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. That's what it says. And this, was, this rule was adopted at the 1972 General Conference about uh, 40, 47 years ago, right? As it was a very close vote in February, there has been a strong resistance about the result around the nation and some parts of the Europe ever since then, and the need for call to action uh, is increasing as, uh, as each local annual conferences are being held in the coming weeks. So things are still being unfolded, uh, getting unfolded. No one knows if our journey is going to stay at, uh, in Antioch or the northern part of Asia or over the water to Macedonia. No one knows if there will be an established system waiting for us to utilize. No one knows if there will be a uh, Lydia standing there instead a Lydia, a Gentile, a foreign business woman. No one knows if it will be at the core of the downtown of this big city or at the riverbanks outside of our walls. No one knows what's going to happen. But the key that we need to learn, again, is to stay open. Stay open. Open to how God will lead us open to where God will lead us, open to whom God will lead us to. Let me share my fear. My fear. My fear is not that we are going to be called something else other than the United Methodist Church. I don't fear if we are going to be able to use the cross and flame symbol anymore. But I do fear, I do fear, if by whatever reason that we won't get to see each other because of certain disagreements, to see each other because of certain disagreements. I do fear if our human tendency to choose being closed instead of being open. And the denominational situation is just one example of this tendency of leaning towards closeness. In the current status of the nation, the political nature, the media, is cornering people more and more to choose being closed between a person and another person rather than choosing openness 
to embrace differences, to embrace humanness. That being said, one of the things that I wanted to say today to all of us is to thank us for hanging in here. I wanted to say that today, to thank you for hanging in here. Because unless you are a pastor like me or a lifelong United Methodist, I know that you have all the reasons to not be involved in this conflict, right? And choose something easier for your life. But we are here together. That's the reality. So thank you for choosing to see the humanness in each other. Thank you for choosing to see the stories, to listen to those stories in each other. Thank you for choosing to embrace the brokenness of each other. And thank you for being here to make this body more whole with all of our differences. Let me end with a simple illustration. So Noah has been playing uh, t-ball recently. And one of the things he doesn't like is to play the first base. First base. Because what they're learning nowadays in their level is, to, uh, is that once the batter hits the ball, you grab the ball and throw it to the first base. Right? That's what all, they're, all they're learning right now. And Noah is afraid of balls being thrown at him. So what he would do is to turn his back away from the ball when he is playing first base. And from the bench, what do I shout at him? You have to keep your eyes on the ball. You need to see where the ball is coming from if you want to catch it. You have to see it. I say this because I know exactly how it feels. I remember being stressed out whenever my coach told me to cover the first base. Because the, usually in the ch- children's league, the kid, play, the kid playing the ke- uh, pitcher is usually the bigger one the strong one with the strong shoulder and fastball. So I remember that fear whenever the pitcher threw the ball at me. But I don't just remember that fear piece. I remember overcoming that fear. And not just overcoming that fear, but once you're past that point, what happens is that baseball becomes fun. I was able to understand the joy of the game of baseball. And there's no turning back. So no matter what is it, what it is that is before us, before you, either the destination of the United Methodist Church or the heat of the political climate of this nation or a situation that you may be facing in your personal life. Either a conflict in a relationship or an unclear future. Let us not turn our backs. But let us keep our eyes on the ball. Let us keep our eyes on the vision that God gives us. Let us keep our eyes open to the other side of the continent. And let us keep our eyes on every amazing, beautiful person in this sanctuary today and be thankful to us who is willing to choose to hang in here together. And most of all, We give thanks to God's grace, which granted us this moment, this space, this place of prayer, 
where our diverse stories and journeys can come across one another. And the joy and lots of love, a lot of love, that we will all experience beyond this fastball coming towards us. So for that kingdom of God, thanks be to God. Amen.